morning. Uh, my daughter Molly actually uh, vetted my clothing today to make sure that I met the code. And so she said, you know, the sleeves and the legs and so on. So didn't want to get into trouble. So um, how many people here uh, don't know what they want to be when they grow up? <laughs> okay, so you notice that my hand is up too. Um, and the thing is, I never did know what I wanted to do when I grew up because I was interested in basically everything. Um, and I always hated those other kids that said, oh, I want to be a doctor. And they always knew from the time they were taught they wanted to be a doctor. I was always very envious of them. But not anymore because I think that, um, you know, I look back on my life and I really followed a crooked path. Partly because of the people I met along the way and partly because of things that happened to me, uh, both good and bad things. Um, I grew up in a place called Brampton, Ontario, and if you've ever been there, you'll understand that all I wanted to do was get out of there. So I went to, um, I looked on the map as the furthest place away that I could go to university, and that was UBC. In fact, I could have gone to Victoria, but I settled for Vancouver because I wanted to be in the mountains and by the ocean. I didn't really know what the university offered. I didn't really care. Um, but in my second year there, I was so bored. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I signed up for an economics course for some reason, <laughs> thinking commerce. Uh, I don't even know how to open a bank account. But anyway, um, <laughs> so I went to see one of my profs one day because I was really discouraged. I just thought, what am I doing here? And she said, you don't belong here. You go to Europe. You don't belong here. And I said, really? Like, where? And she was German, so she said, Germany. And I said, well, I don't speak German. And she said, that's okay. So the next thing I know, I was signing up for an exchange program to the University of Waterloo to go study in Germany. And I arrived in Frankfurt on a train, had no idea what people were saying to me. Well, first, at Waterloo, they wanted to interview me, and they said, so how's your German? And I said, uh, I don't speak German. They said, oh, come on, like as if everybody speaks German. But in fact, in Waterloo, a lot of people do. There's a lot of German families there. That's in Ontario. It used to be called Berlin, I think. Anyway, um, so he said, I'm going to talk to you in German, and you tell me what I said. And I said, I'm telling you, I don't speak German. So he says, like, wie geht's dir, Schachstuka? And I said, I don't know what he said. He goes, you'll do fine. So the next thing you know, I'm on a train headed from Frankfurt to Mannheim, Germany. And I get to the my residence. I have no idea what people are saying. Honestly, it's like, it's like, oh my god. And I thought, okay, I'll just pack up my bags and go home tomorrow. This has been a really stupid idea. So then, as I'm opening up my suitcase, I get a note. I read a note from my dad saying, "We're so proud of you, and we know you're going to do well. And you know, hang in there." And I was like, oh man, now I can't go home. <laughs> So I pushed through, I, I learned how to knit during my classes because I couldn't take notes. And I watched a lot of Dallas, the show Dallas in German. And Saisonstrasse, which is Sesame Street in German. And eventually I learned German, then I realized I didn't really want to talk to these people. So I went back to UBC and finished my degree. And I had a degree in political science because while I was in Germany, I became very politically active, much to my mother's chagrin. She was worried I was becoming a terrorist or something. <laughs> and so I had this degree in political science. Well, what do you do with that? I have no idea. Um, and so a friend of mine, again, this is an example of meeting someone along my path, uh, worked in a women's prison, and she said, well, you know, they're hiring right now at Family Center for Women, why don't you apply? And I said, well, I haven't even taken psychology. She said, that doesn't matter. So I said, well, I speak German, you know. <laughs> so, so I applied for the job, and the warden said, um, I think it was the last thing he was doing before retiring, so he gave me the job. I was really bad at it, because I was terrified. And, but I did it for a year, and I actually found it, um, like, I, I had to work the night shift alone, and you had to do these rounds where you check on the prisoners, it's well, all women, and they knew that I was scared, so they would hide in their little rooms and jump up to scare me at the windows. So, after a year, but 
But the good thing about it was I talked to these women about their stories, like how they ended up in jail, what crimes they committed, how they committed those crimes. It was really fascinating. And I thought, you know, a lot of them were really cool women who just had had really crappy lives and had, you know, good stories to tell. So from there, I applied to journalism school because, again, I met a friend who said, well, I'm in journalism school. Why don't you apply there? I said, okay. So I applied to journalism school. And um, while I was applying for jobs out of journalism school at the Toronto Star, the guy interviewing me saw that I had gone to Germany without learning German, and he was so impressed by that that he hired me. Like, he didn't even know what kind of writer I was or a good journalist. He just thought anyone who can go to Germany without speaking German, you know, has got to have some kind of gumption or is an idiot. So. <laughs> So he took a chance on me and I worked at the Star uh, for the summer and then from there I wanted to come to Montreal because again I had a friend in Montreal who said it's a great city. <laughs> so I called the editor at the Gazette and I just kept pestering him every single week. Have you got a job for me? Got a job for me? Got a job for me? And finally he hired me because I think I just drove him crazy. He said let's just give her a job. So I arrived in Montreal not knowing French, and as you know, that's kind of a liability when you're working as a journalist. So I had to, um, you know, I had to learn. Uh, I had to learn French pretty quickly, and I made a lot of really um, stupid mistakes. And so through this whole journey, and like I'm still at the Gazette, I've done other job, worked at other places, the Canadian press. I've uh, gone to work in England and in Africa to report from Rwanda and so on. And now I've ended up back in, um, at the Gazette as the justice reporter. So I cover courts and crime. Uh, most recently I covered the Luca Magnata murder trial, which was one of the most uh, difficult uh, things to cover in my life, in my career. Um, so, um, so I tell you these stories of me making a fool of myself, uh, not not uh, for you to think I'm nuts, which you might, but but to encourage you to do something every day that scares you, like to speak to someone you don't know, push yourself out of your comfort zone, and make a fool of yourself. It's okay to make a fool of yourself. Nobody's really going to notice uh, because everybody else is making fools of themselves. So. Um, so even when I became a grown-up, I was making these kind of choices, like daring to shake up my world, um, including thinking it would be a good idea to have a baby in Bangkok, Thailand, which is where Molly was born. Um, she's now 18 and has graduated from Villa, and that was two years ago, and she still has the prom dress uh, she spent months searching for, which is probably what you're doing right now. So if anybody wants a prom dress, we've got one. <laughs> that will never be worn again, with matching shoes, which took months to find. Um, so I don't regret for one second having her, of course, she's the joy of my life, but I wouldn't recommend uh, to anyone to have a child in a stinking hot, uh, noisy, crowded Bangkok. Uh, it was not fun. Um, and so now I've been a journalist for almost 30 years, and it's a job I really love. Every day is different, I'm always learning things. And there are days that are boring, of course, and there are days that are very, very stressful. Um, but one of the things I like about it is when I write a story that helps bring about some kind of change in the world uh, or in my community. Um, most recently, I started a hashtag called, uh, the hashtag has been raped, never reported. I don't know if you guys are on Twitter. I am. <laughs> very proud of the fact that I know how to use Twitter. Um, and it, it, it was uh, in the fall I started this, and it was about my own story about sexual abuse and rape. I was sexually abused by my grandfather when I was young and uh, raped when I worked as a flight attendant. Um, and it's probably the only story I haven't been able to tell until recently. And I tell it now uh, to you to show you that even when life doesn't go well and bad things happen to you, you have the strength to live through it. And it doesn't have to destroy you, and nor should it. In fact, it's probably because of what happened to me 
um, that I went into journalism uh, because I wanted to listen to others when no one else would and to tell these stories when their voices weren't heard. And that's what happened to me, that nobody listened and nobody wanted to hear my story. So I guess I just don't want that to happen to others. So in closing, I have three things for you to remember. Not as you search out a career necessarily, but as you go through life. One, it doesn't matter what you do as long as you do something. It, you know, you're never going to know what you want to do until you try things. And you may try it and you may hate it, like I did hating having a baby in Bangkok. But it makes a great story, right? So, and you can, and nothing is carved in stone. You can always change direction like I did and like many, many people do. Um, you don't have to stick to one thing at all, and in my opinion, you shouldn't. So as long as you're doing something, uh, just don't sit in your parents' basement watching TV the rest of your life. So um, that's one thing. Second thing is to travel and see the world. And when you travel, stay on Facebook, uh, be in the moment, talk to the people in the countries that you travel in. Um, to me, travel is one of the best educations you can get. Uh, I've traveled to, I don't know how many countries, um, most of them in Africa, Europe, um, South America, and those are the best experiences in terms of opening up your mind and uh, allowing you to understand the world more. And number three, help others. It's a great thing, uh, to help people that aren't as well off as you are. We live in a pretty privileged situation here in Canada, but there are a lot of people here who come from other countries who are really suffering. Um, so it's really good for your mental health, I can tell you that firsthand, to help other people. And finally, remember that life really is a journey. Um, you know, you don't become somebody and then that's the end of it. It's always changing, always evolving. There'll be things that happen to you, both good and bad. You just have to take the whole package and remember that really you are stronger than you think and you're more powerful than you think. And I really think that your generation, I feel that there's a shift happening in the world right now and society and I really think that uh, young women are going to have their voices heard uh, more than ever. So go out there and conquer the world.